The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 17th chapter. Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my Son, the Beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up, and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, another week and another mountain. For those who have been keeping track, we've been on a mountainside with Jesus for the entire month of February. Three weeks ago, after calling his disciples and teaching and healing and drawing quite a crowd and doing so, Jesus climbs up a mountainside, sits down, and begins to teach or preach what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And as we heard over these past three weeks, Jesus describes this new way of life, a new kingdom that God is ushering in around us. In all of this, Jesus is showing us how God is upsetting the ways in which we've understood how this world operates. We hear how the outcast and downtrodden are given a whole new lease on life. We hear how we've all been called and equipped and sent to live in the kingdom. And we've heard how we are supposed to live because of all of this. Watching Jesus build on the law and tradition and covenant and promise that God has made with the Jewish people so long ago. So now that we've reached the end of this epiphany season... Today we jump quite ahead, quite a ways ahead in Jesus' ministry to this other mountain. All these chapters later, we witness Jesus leading three of his disciples up the mountain where he is transfigured before them. He's visibly, visibly changed. His face shines like the sun. His clothes become dazzling white. It must have been quite a show for those that were around him. Because as we also heard just after that blinding moment, these two important historical figures show up out of nowhere. Now there's Jesus and Moses and Elijah just hanging out, talking like old friends do. You just never know what you might encounter when you start following Jesus. If you've been around for a while, you know that we hear the story of the transfiguration every year on the weekend before we enter into Lent. And I don't know what it is about this story, but every year that I hear it, I love it even more. I especially love Peter's response to his experience. Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. It is good for us to be here. To me, it always felt as though Peter was getting caught up in the moment of this experience. To me, it sounded like he didn't want the experience to end. He didn't want to come back down the mountainside, back into the real world, so much so that he was willing to build three dwellings right there so no one had to leave. But this year when I read it, I was hearing things a little bit differently. What if... For Peter, it was less about having this 
what I'd call a selfish desire to never want this experience to end and never have to go back and and leave and go into the real world? And what if it was more about Peter's desire to show hospitality and welcome to these important figures in God's story? That made me think about this in a whole new way because it, it shifted Peter's response from being that kind of selfish guy to being someone focused on humble service. What if that reaction was an act of hospitality? I think I've been thinking more about that because of a show that I recently saw. A couple weeks ago, Kim and I went to Kansas City to see the touring show of um, Come From Away. It's a musical based on stories from September 11th, the terrorist attacks. Has anyone seen this or heard of it? Very good. It's, it's kind of hard to believe that there can be a musical about September 11th, but this particular story is about the town in a Canadian province of Newfoundland. And maybe you remember that after the terrorist attacks on September 11th, all air traffic in the country was halted. No more planes could take off, and any planes that were already in the air needed to be grounded as soon as they could. So this town in the province of Newfoundland had a population of about 7,000. And it also had quite a large airport from the days when jets couldn't make it all the way across the Atlantic. And these days, that airport saw one, maybe two planes max each day. But on the afternoon of September 11, 2001, 38 planes landed at that airport, carrying in total about seven or 8,000 people more than doubling this town's population with no knowledge of when they could get back into the air to go home. So for the next three to four days, the people of this town showed the true meaning of hospitality, providing food, clothes, shelter, medicine, toiletries, phones to call home, computers to connect with other people, but most importantly, care and concern for these lost and vulnerable and scared people who just showed up literally out of nowhere with no warning. It was such a moving example of hospitality and love. I'd love for you all to go see it. I mean, I could be a professional show reviewer, right? I'll just stick with a church gig. But having just seen that show was making me give Peter's reaction to this just a, a new perspective a whole new meaning, he sees this unbelievable scene unfolding before him. And his immediate reaction is to welcome those who are there, show them hospitality. He's literally welcoming God's work in his midst. And with there being so many reflections and connections pointing back to God's work through Moses and Elijah, those disciples who were there, they knew that they were witnesses to the work of God. And they were being a part of something bigger. But before we give Peter too much credit for honoring God's work here, we also need to remember his checkered past with Jesus. In the verses that lead up to this story of the transfiguration, we hear Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus tells Peter that he's the rock on which Jesus will build his church. But then... Peter goes on to rebuke Jesus about, after he hears about the forthcoming suffering and death. And finally, Jesus rebukes him and says, Peter, you are sending your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Those words are what are ringing in the disciples' ears as they head up the mountain. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. I mean, how often do we get wrapped up in our human things, getting stuck in the ways of this world or forgetting about the ways that, that of God and the realities of God's kingdom? Just like how Peter can forget that the reality of God's kingdom is unlike any reality we're used to, we forget what God's kingdom could look like around us. So again, when Peter starts to experience this reality of God on top of the mountain, he's celebrating 
He's offering these guests hospitality and care. He's witnessing who Jesus truly is. But then, when God's voice comes out of the cloud and more of God is revealed, all three of the disciples fall to the ground in fear. A little bit of God is okay, but too much God might be too much to handle. That feels kind of simple to say, but how often do we get these glimpses of what God is up to and think, oh, that's pretty neat. I can get on board with this whole kingdom thing. But then as things move and we get deeper into all of it and experience more of what God is doing and and maybe even hear God's voice in some way or another, then it all becomes too much. We fall to the ground in fear. We couldn't possibly welcome 7,000 strangers into our town, into our homes, into our lives. We, possibly, we couldn't possibly build our ministry to support another 200 kids and build lives of them in Christ. We couldn't possibly believe that we're to see that person as a brother or sister in Christ. I mean, I don't disagree when Jesus says the first will be last and last will be first, but I don't want to have to live that out. A little God is okay, but too much God is too much to handle. But then what does God or Jesus say to us in the midst of that fear and distrust? He says, get up, do not be afraid. I feel like we have seen God, don't you? Through the season of epiphany throughout our whole lives, we've experience the power of what God can do. We know that God's ways can outshine human ways every time, but can we fully live into this kingdom? We'll soon be coming down the mountain and entering into that season we call Lent. We're going to witness again Jesus' journey through suffering and to his death on a cross. We're going to recall all the ways that we are surrounded by that same suffering and death and how we are surrounded by the chaos that fills this world. But before we begin that journey, we are once again reminded about what we've already witnessed, the light of Christ, the power that God has overcome all chaos and darkness, the witness of God's work throughout time, and the continued promise that God will always be present in our lives and in this world. And so as we come down that mountain, as we come back into the chaos of our real lives, and as we get stunned and halted in fear, always hear Jesus' words to get up and do not be afraid. Amen.